Well, yesterday morning I was out running on uh, the Ben Garen trails, and uh, I was the first person that got on the trail that morning. You know how? I know that. Because when you're running and you're the first person on the trail, all of a sudden you feel that, that warm embrace go across your face, and then that little spider crawls up your neck. My, my wife, listen, she tracks my runs so she, she knows I don't die out there, you know. And I guarantee you, you can see the spikes and the heart rate as I'm running down that trail. Oh, there's another one. Ah, I finally picked up a stick and just started running with that stick in front of me like this. I mean, it was just one after another. Now, listen, I used to like history about as much as I like spider webs and spiders. And that says a lot. I'm, I never was a big history fan growing up in school. But listen... I've gotten to where, as I've grown as a Christian, I've loved history. And one of the things that changed everything for me was when I realized that history is really the story of God. That's all that is. And when you start looking at it that way, it changes your entire perspective on everything. And so we're going to look at a little bit of history as we've been doing in this uh, series called Epic, and, and man, I just, I want to thank Brad so much for allowing me the opportunity to, to get to, to do this and, and to get to preach. I really love getting the opportunity to do this and just to open up God's Word and to read it and see the richness that's in here, even within the pages of history. So I want you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 20, Exodus chapter 20. Now, we can't start in Exodus chapter 20 because we got to get caught up. Last week, if you remember, we ended with the uh, sacrifice of Isaac, right? The, the not sacrifice of Isaac. And you, and you remember that uh, Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac. God provided a ram and saved Isaac. We know how much that points to Jesus. And we talked about how epic that story was. Uh, but it continues on from there. And we see that the covenant was not only reaffirmed to Abraham because of his faith, but it was also reaffirmed to his son Isaac as well. And we can see the story of Isaac in Scripture. And then he had a set of twins, uh, Jacob and Esau. Jacob ended up getting the blessing uh, through a, a crazy set of circumstances. And Jacob, uh, the covenant was passed through Jacob. And then we see at some point, remember, Jacob starts wrestling with an angel of the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not, I, I can't imagine doing that. But for, for whatever reason, Jacob wrestles uh, with this angel of the Lord. And God literally changes Jacob's name to what? Do you remember? Israel. That's where we get the name Israel today. It means he who wrestles or struggles with God. And so Jacob's name has changed. We start to see uh, the birth of the Israelite nation through this. Jacob's second oldest son then is sold into slavery by his brothers, right? A guy named Joseph. He ends up in Egypt as a slave, but through God's grace and God's providence, he ends up being second in command over all of Egypt, uh, just right beneath the Pharaoh himself. Uh, we know that a great famine struck the land. This famine caused Jacob to look to his other sons and said, look, we got to find some food. And they were like, well, we've heard Egypt has some food. So they go to Egypt. They find out, hey, their brother's there. His bro their brother doesn't want to kill him. They thought he was going to kill him, but he, he wasn't. He was grateful. He's, he invites Jacob and the whole family, all the Israelites at that point, to come into the land of Egypt and to settle there because it was a great land. They had plenty of food. He could take care of his family there. And so Israel did, moved his family there. They started to multiply. God blessed them greatly. But then there came a time when there was a Pharaoh born that didn't remember all the promises that the original Pharaoh had made with the Israelites. And all he did is he looked up and saw all these Israelites growing and multiplying getting probably more numerous than the Egyptians themselves. It scared him. He said, we've got to enslave these people or they're going to overrun us. So they enslaved the Israelites. They became bricklayers. Uh, just, I mean, they, they uh, enslaved them completely. For over 400 years, they were enslaved. Uh, and then one day, there was this guy named Moses 
who was born and through a set of circumstances ended up in the court of the Pharaoh as one of the sons of the Pharaoh, like adopted into his family. He was raised in the court. He found out he was an Israelite, went out to check things out and saw a sla Egyptian slave master literally beating up one of the Israelites. Moses got mad, decided to protect him, incidentally killed the Egyptian, ended up having to flee for his life into the wilderness, into uh, this place uh, where he just simply took off all the robes of being a prince's son and became a shepherd. And, um, and he lived there for many, many years, got married, became a part of a family there. And I think he probably thought he was done. And then all of a sudden, he's up on the mountain one time and he sees this bush and it's burning, but it's not being consumed, right? And so he goes up there and this voice comes from the bush and says, Moses, take off your shoes. This is holy ground. God is about to speak to you. It was amazing. And God tells Moses, listen, I want you to go back and I want you to set my people free from the, the Egyptians. And so Moses wasn't the most enthusiastic about it. He actually gave all kinds of excuses and uh, ends up including his brother Aaron in it. But they eventually get uh, to Egypt uh, through a crazy set of circumstances. Many of you know this story, you know, the God sends all these plagues through, through Moses and Aaron onto the Egyptians. They are, uh, the Pharaohs finally, at, after the last one, the, the last uh, plague is uh, the angel of death who came and killed every firstborn um, son in, in Pharaoh's family all the way down to the lowest person in Egypt. There's great wailing and mourning in Egypt. And finally, Pharaoh said, okay, you guys can go. And so they left. Pharaoh changed his mind, remember, in the middle of Israel fling, comes after Israel, and uh, God parts the Red Sea. The Israelites pass through the Red Sea. The Egyptians try to, but the Red Sea collapses on them, kills them. And now we find the Israelites in the middle of this wilderness, in the middle of this desert, at the foot of this mountain called Mount Sinai. And now God's about to speak to them. Now, that's what brings us now up to the Ten Commandments. In short, I promise there's a lot more you need to read. Uh, but that, that kind of gets us to where we are today in the Ten Commandments. Now, I want you to look with me at Exodus chapter 20, and I want to start in verse 2. And I promise we're going to hit verse 1 here in a little while, but I want to start in verse 2. Look at what, what God says here. He's speaking now. Moses has gone up onto the mountain, and God is speaking to him, and he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. Now, if you know, many times throughout Scripture, we're, we're preaching and we're talking about the New Testament a lot of times. And in the New Testament, whenever we see this word, therefore, we always stop and we're like, oh, what's that therefore? That's always the phrase we use. So we look back and we go, okay, because of what's been said before, now this. And this is just like a huge therefore right here. God is saying, listen, because of everything that has taken place, because of me bringing you out of 400 years of slavery, because of the covenant promises I've made to your family, because of all of that, now this. But it's even more than that. It's even more epic than this. Listen to this. This is not just about God right now giving uh, some random words to his people. What he's doing right now is he's extending the covenant to where it was supposed to be in the first place. You remember, God told Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 that he was going to take Abraham. He's going to make his name great. He was going to give him the, the promised land. He was going to make him a great nation. Anyone who blesses Israel, he's going to bless. If anyone curses Israel, he's going to curse. And so right here, what we see is that God is now about to fulfill part of that covenant and make Israel not just a big family anymore, but he's going to make them into the nation of Israel because a nation literally needs codified laws to be who they are. They have to have these set of laws. That's what makes a nation a nation. 
some kind of constitution, some kind of word, some kind of document. And this is the first document we have. As a matter of fact, in Deuteronomy, the passage talks about how God actually took tablets of stone and wrote these Ten Commandments on tablets of stone. There's some people that say he may have taken uh, the first four and placed them on one and the, the, the last six and placed them on another. Many biblical scholars say that God probably made two copies because back in those days, that's how you did contracts. You made two copies. But they placed those in the Ark of the Covenant. And the reason they placed them in the Ark of the Covenant was because it was part of the covenant promise that God had made to them. He was going to make them a great nation. And here we see that beginning to happen right now. So it was a it was just this light bulb moment for the Israelites saying, oh man, God's about to speak to us. He's about to give us these words. And this is where we fall into the covenant promise that he's made to us. It's huge. So let's look at these commandments as God gives them. They're so important. Commandment number one is found in verse three. Look at what it says. It says, do not have other gods besides me. Now, in t- today's we, we would look at that and we'll go, of course. We have no other gods beside me because most of us would say, there's no other gods. That's easy. There's one God. But you've got to realize back in these days, this was incredibly rare. As a matter of fact, in our world today, that's actually incredibly rare. If you go anywhere around the world, you'll find out very quickly that there are other smaller G gods all over the place. You go to... Uh, the country of India, and you'll find multiple, multiple millions of gods. You go to places even in the Middle East where you would say Islam is is the rule, and you're going to find underneath Islam, you're going to find all these different folk religions that follow all these other gods. We lived in Tanzania for many years, and the tribe of people that we worked with were Muslim But all of them would say the same thing. We might be Muslim on the surface, but at night, we still go and worship our ancestors. You see, they they all would say underneath all of this is really, truly this polytheism, this, this worshiping other small g gods. And this was unheard of in these days, though. Monotheism was just not a thing. And God was saying, listen, what, what he was saying at this point in time is, I'm the only God. I'm the only one worthy because of what just happened in Egypt, because of what I just did for you. I'm the only God that really matters. And you also have to look at what his message was all throughout. If you look through the book of Exodus up to that point and you see God interacting with Moses and Aaron and the Pharaohs, you see constantly God saying, listen, I am doing this to show myself off to the nations because I want them to know that there is a true God in Israel. I want them to know me. I don't want the Egyptians to follow these small gods. You see, a lot of times we look at this and we go, oh, Egypt, bad guys, Israel, good guys. But that's not the way God sees it. God loved the Egyptians. Do you realize that? God created the Egyptians. They're his children, just as the Israelites were his children. God loves all the people of the world. He's the one who created them. And he wants the Egyptians to turn to him as the one true God and quit following after their small G gods. And so when when he gives this commandment saying, do not have other gods beside me, this was huge. It was mind-blowing to these Israelites, but also to all the world that saw this nation being formed around this one thing because all the nations around all had polytheism as their their foundation. So look at commandment number two. This is verses four through six. It says, do not make an idol for yourself, whether in the shape of anything in the heavens above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow and worship to them and do not serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, bringing the consequences of the Father's iniquity on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing faithful love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. Now, listen, not only is monotheism unique, but not worshiping idols was completely unique as well. At that point in time, the whole world was worshiping idols. As a matter of fact, in this case, the Hebrew word for idol 
is literally something physical. It's something tangible. It's something made by human hands. And in this case, when God's saying, don't make idols for yourself, he's telling them very specifically, just don't make anything that, that you might happen to worship. And this was unique in that time. Um, we also see this commandment reveals part of God's character as well. What does it say? It says that he's a jealous God. Now, many times with the English language, we see that word jealous, and it has some negative connotations to it. As a matter of fact, sometimes it would even fall into sin. But the Hebrew word is actually completely different. It's the opposite of that. It would have a very positive meaning to it. When the Israelites were to read this and say, There's a, he's a jealous God, they would rejoice in that. They would say, that's incredible, because what it did is it spoke to God upholding his covenant promise to Israel. He was saying, listen, I am so powerful. I am such a, a, a God that loves you so much. I'm going to keep that promise, that covenant, no matter what happens. I'm jealous, and I want you to be loyal to that covenant. And the, the Israelites would rejoice in that and see that as a very positive thing. And then one of the things that we see in this passage is it talks about the consequences of the father's iniquity on the children to the third and fourth generation. Now, a lot of times that's spoken of in negative connotations when we talk about that, how, well, how can God place uh, the, the responsibility and the punishment, the consequences of sin on the children when it was the father who did that. But that's not the context and what we're talking about here. What's happening here is, is in an Israelite family, it was very common for three and four generations to live under the same roof together. We would never consider that, right? When, when you know, our sons get old enough, it's time for them to move out, amen? Yeah, and so we don't, we don't talk about that. We, we talk about it in negative consequences when the mother-in-law wants to move back in, right? It just, amen. That just doesn't happen, right? But in these, day, in these days, it was very common. Families lived together under the same roof. Great-grandparents, grandparents, um, you know, aunts, uncles, the whole clan would live together. And so when it says this, that the father's iniquity would fall on the children to the third and fourth generation. It's just saying that the father's iniquity affects the entire household. And you see that. We see that all the time. And when we see fathers that follow after Jesus Christ, and we see them give their life to Christ and begin to grow, we see the families follow so many times. I'll never forget, um, I was in Boy Scouts a long time ago. I don't always admit that, but I was an Eagle Scout. And right here in this church, and uh, I loved it. I had a scoutmaster named Bob Stevenson. And Bob Stevenson was here a long time, uh, passed away uh, uh, many years ago. Sherry's uh, still in the sound booth, I think, brings uh, snacks up there every single Sunday. I never get any, by the way. I'm just saying. Uh, but she's up there. She takes care of our sound team and uh, does a great job. But, but I love Bob. And we would go on all kinds of uh, camping trips together. And we did all kinds of fun stuff together. But let me tell you, there will, there will never be a day that I won't forget the one time when I'm, I was sitting right down here. And I remember during the invitation one Sunday, I see some movement out of the corner of my eye. And they used to always sit somewhere up here in the balcony. And I see him get up and start walking down to the aisle to give his life to Christ. And I thought, oh, my goodness. That's the most awesome thing I've ever seen. And you know what? I'm telling you. When he gave his life to Christ, I saw many of the boys that he was in leadership over. I saw changes in them. I saw everything change because of his influence. And that's just what a father can do. That's what a leader in the church can do. And God can change and do anything that he wants to with somebody like that. That's what we're talking about here. As a matter of fact, when a father, a man, gives his life to Christ and begins to follow God, he even says he wants to show his faithful love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. He's saying, listen, that ripples through all eternity. What you do when you give your life to Christ, it influences generation after generation after generation. That's what he's talking about here. Look at commandment number three, verse seven. 
It says, do not misuse the name of the Lord your God because the Lord will not leave anyone unpunished who misuses his name. Now, a lot of people just, I think, take this to say, don't use God's name in a way that's kind of like a cuss word. And I think that's part of it. I really do. I don't think we ought to use God's name in an irreverent manner to use it as a cuss word. We hear that all the time in our culture. And I think it's offensive, and it should be. That's our God. And people use that name in vain, and they shouldn't. But it's, it's so much more than that. As a matter of fact, if you look at the original Hebrew, I think a lot of people would better translate it this way. It says, you shall not lift up the name of Yahweh your God to worthlessness. Does that make sense? Listen, there were a number of examples in Scripture that we can see of this worship, working. It, it, it might be like empty worship coming into uh, the seats here and saying, oh, Christ, be magnified, but not really meaning it. That would be taking the Lord's name in vain. When we come into the worship time and we, we sing these great songs, and yet we really don't mean it in our lives. We, we're not following it the rest of the week. Or maybe, you know, in judicial proceedings during that day and age, you would swear by the name of Yahweh that you would tell the truth. And then if you were to lie, that would be a way in which you would take the Lord's name in vain. Maybe you made a promise or a vow in Yahweh's name, and breaking that promise would be taking the Lord's name in vain. Maybe like a prophet, you were delivering a word from the Lord, and yet that word you knew was false. That would be taking the Lord's name in vain. And then lastly, there's a missional component to this. It would be just like a priest back in those days, bearing the name of Jesus, bearing the name of God or Yahweh and wearing the priestly garments but not living a life that really um, you know, reflected that at all. In the same way, just like we do today, we, we would say, hey, I'm a Christian, but then we live opposite of that. That's taking the Lord's name in vain. Or we say we're a Christian, but we're not telling other people about Jesus. That would be taking the Lord's name in vain. So don't do that. Look at commandment number four. It says, uh, verses eight through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You are to labor six days and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You must not do any work, you, your son or daughter, your male or female servant, your livestock or the resident alien who's within your city gates. For the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything in them in six days. Then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and declared it holy. Now, this was actually another unique institution. Most people don't realize, but there is good evidence, and actually no evidence to the contrary, but good evidence that shows that this is literally the institution of the seven-day week that we still use today. Before that, there was no seven-day week. They, they measured dates and, and uh, ceremonies and times and things like that, but they did not have a seven-day week until this was instituted. And so what we have to understand here is that this is very clearly a command in Scripture that tells us that God has created us for a specific purpose. He's created us, yes, to work, and we are to work uh, God has instituted that, but he's saying, listen, it's up to certain limits. We are supposed to work, and then we work six days, and we rest a seventh day. And this is just a, a pattern that God showed us in creation. It's a pattern that we're to follow as well. It's a great principle for us to learn and understand. But this has a vertical element to it in that we take one day out of seven to simply focus on who God is and worship him. And uh, so many times, I know you're busy during the week and you've got things going. Maybe you can barely squeeze your Bible reading in or devotion or, or prayer or anything like that. But God is saying, listen, I want you to take one day a week and I want you to devote it to me. I think that's one of the reasons why church attendance is so important. It's so important for us to get in the habit of meeting together and being able to come together corporately and worship together. As a matter of fact, the Israelites would have done this as a, in a corporate fashion. They, they wouldn't be just doing this alone. They would be coming together as family and clans to worship Yahweh 
uh, together. And this is the vertical element, but there's also the horizontal element as well. And that is, it's just simply good for you. God created us. He knows how we work. And we just need Sabbath days of rest. That's just how it works. But listen, this wasn't just for the Israelites. That's what's cool about this command is we see throughout Scripture, particularly Isaiah 56, 4, it talks about how this command includes also foreigners who might be living in the land. It also includes slaves. It even included animals in this. We are supposed to include everybody in this. And, and, and this didn't matter if you were male, female, slave, who, where you were status-wise, if you were a foreigner, whatever, you were designed to do this. And so it's a horizontal element as well. And that takes us to commandment number five. Look at what verse 12 says. It says, honor your father and your mother so that you may have a long life in the land and the Lord your God, that the Lord your God is giving you. Now, automatically, we immediately think, children, honor your father and your mother. But it doesn't say that, does it? Oh, I never thought about that before. It just basically says, honor your father and your mother. Now, in Ephesians, Paul actually adds the word children to this. But in this case, we see, honor your father and your mother. And this, again, goes back to the family unit. And how this is about how we as families ought to come together and honor each other. It's, it's, this is for all people living together that we're to honor one another. Uh, this is highlighting the importance of family in the Israelite society. And it's a great example for us as well. You see, the family in ancient Israel was important in three different ways. One, it was socially important. Um, this is where uh, grace, grassroots level uh, judicial proceedings took place with the elders of the family. We also see uh, Israelites providing military defense through the family. Whenever you see, um, you know, uh, the king uh, in future days calling for uh, the military men, they always come out as families or clans. That's how this worked. We also see socially that the education was all done within the home in, in, in Israelite society. Then also economically, listen, this is how God continued the covenant economically of land. Uh, you were given land and your inheritance was given to your children and it was kept in the family. That's how this worked. And then spiritually, it was all about preserving the covenant relationship between Israel and Yahweh. The family was what was responsible for teaching those things. We, we saw it uh, in, uh, you see it in Deuteronomy where he says, listen, paint it on your doorposts, on your, on your signposts, paint it everywhere, put it on your foreheads and on your wrists so that you'll remember the word of the Lord. It was done within the family and the clan. And so we honor your mother and your father, those that are in your household, so that you can continue to make the family the strength. And we, even in today's society, the family has to be the foundation. And don't we see in today's society that just the degradation of the family? The, the culture is just trying as the best they can to destroy the family. And the reason for that is biblical. It's because it's the way God designed it. Look at verse uh, 13, commandment number 6. This is the long one. You might not be able to memorize this one. Do not murder, okay? Now, this is an important word here in Hebrew. It's actually the Hebrew word ratzah. There's actually eight different Hebrew words that could be translated as something like murder or killing. But this one is very particular. As a matter of fact, as a child, how did I memorize it? Some of you remember, thou shalt not kill, right? Right? And now I think the modern translations have gotten closer to it in, in saying uh, do not murder because what this word ratza literally means is it does mean taking someone's life, but it also includes unintentionally taking someone's life in, in the case of like negligent homicide. Like it's saying, listen, don't even do it by accident. Now, one of the things that, that's, that's really interesting about these commandments is that if you flip them over, and, and a lot of these are, you know, you know, given negatively, if you, you change it and make it positively, 
what this says then is, is we ought to honor life. So do not murder, but on the opposite side, we ought to honor life. And, and we see, again, in society, we see a way, uh, constantly ways that we're not honoring life through abortion. Um, I, I know when we go to Tajikistan, it's, it is completely uh, usual, normal, for every single woman in that society to have had at least one to two abortions. Uh, for that culture, that's birth control in that culture, and it's not even thought of as uh, there's no sanctity of life in that culture at all. It's just absolutely amazing. And we're seeing that here in this culture as well. We see it uh, with our uh, older folks as well, with our senior adults, and how uh, we, we constantly hear news reports about uh, you know, nursing homes, senior adult homes, not taking care of the people that are there. We as a church are the ones that are called to take care of that. As a matter of fact, um, you know, the taking care of the elderly would have been done within the Jewish family. That's why those third and fourth generations all live together so they could take care of one another. And so there's this honoring of life, not just not murdering, but we're, we're called to honor life. And then commandment number seven, verse 14, do not commit adultery. Now, there were laws in other societies surrounding Israel at this time against adultery um, in other nations, but they didn't have the, um, uh, the penalties that Israel had associated with this. As a matter of fact, um, many times in the case of adultery in Israelite society, it caused called for the stoning, the death of both the male and the female caught in adultery. This was, uh, I think, part of the reason for this is because God takes this incredibly seriously, obviously. These were God-ordained laws. And he's saying uh, back in, in those days in other nations, they would just penalize by maybe some, some kind of financial restitution or something like that. Israel was one of the, the unique nations at that time that would actually have the death penalty for adultery. And I think it goes to show how important the family is. Again, I think it's helpful to see, think about the opposite. So it's not just do not commit adultery, but the opposite of that would be love your wife and family. Love your wife and family. Because if you don't love your wife and family, the best way to destroy it is to commit adultery. It completely separates everybody. Uh, studies have shown that it just, it, it just does, has negative consequences for the children, for everybody involved. And so do not commit adultery. It's very serious in God's eyes because it breaks up the family unit, which is the foundation of the Israelite society. Commandment number eight, verse 15, do not steal. Now, the penalties for this one were different than other nations around them as well. As a matter of fact, do not steal was the only one that you can find in scripture that doesn't have any associated death penalty for it, okay? Now, the Bible's not saying stealing is okay because of that. There was still punishment for it. But in those days, the nations around Israel would have had penalties like killing somebody for stealing things. But again, I think what God is saying is he's saying there's a priority here. There's a, a set of values, an ordered value system, and that life is so much greater in value. The family is so much greater in value than things. And I think that's what he's proposing here. But again, the opposite of this is pretty cool to think about as well. Don't, he's not saying just do not steal, but the heart of it is, listen, take care of other people's things. Be good stewards of even other people's things, not just yours, but also be generous with what you have. And you see, that, that's something we don't think about all the time. When we see this, do not steal, we're like, oh, I'm good. I haven't stolen anything. But are you generous? Are you, are you taking good care of, of the things that God has placed in your stewardship. Commandment number nine, verse 16, do not give false testimony against your neighbor. Now, this doesn't say do not lie, right? Some of us have translated it that way. It very specifically is talking about a courtroom situation here. But what it's saying, I think, is what it's emphasizing is that in the most important place in society, tell the truth. And all the, everything else ought to fall into that truth as well. 
And so he's saying, listen, we, we've got to uh, always tell the truth. That would be the opposite of, you know, giving false testimony. We just always want to be above reproach and tell the truth no matter what. Commandment number 10 is the last one. Verse 17, do not covet your neighbor's house. Do not covet your neighbor's wife, his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, so what is coveting? It says, do not covet. Coveting would be like wrongly directed love or basically putting other people or things in the rightful place of God. That's what coveting is. Now, if the eighth commandment, do not steal, is unique in that there were no punishments for death, this one's completely unique to any society back in those day and ages. Because can you adjudicate coveting? No, there's actually no punishments for coveting in Scripture because you can't, because coveting actually happens within the heart. And so this, is, this would have been unheard of uh, in those day and ages to have any kind of law that has to do with coveting because it's something that can't be proven in a court of law. It's something that can't necessarily be punished. It's just telling the Israelites, listen, this is how you ought to form your foundation. And what's cool about this is it ultimately circles us right back around to the first commandment. There should be no other gods before me. Isn't that, isn't that amazing how God has worked and come full circle and he's just saying, listen, out of all these things, just put me first. That's the most important thing. Now, I told you we skipped verse 1 and we did that for a reason. I want you to look back with me, chapter 20, verse 1. It said, then God spoke all these words. Now, first thing you'll notice is that he doesn't call these commandments we actually put that title on there. We, call it, we say the Ten Commandments, but they're actually just ten words. It says, God spoke all these words. And so the question is, what would the Israelites back in those days have thought when they heard this, that God spoke all these words to Moses? Well, I think it would have just immediately popped into their mind to go back to the creation story because what did God do when he created the world? God said, let there be light, and there was. In the same way, God is saying these words and they just are. Now, it's not saying that all of a sudden these laws just all of a sudden magically appeared because God said these at this point in time. But what's happening here is that these laws were already created within us when God created the world. When God created humankind, we know that this law was already written on our heart because we see it fleshed out all through Genesis in the first part of Exodus. You see Cain killing Abel, and he knew it was wrong. You know, you see all of these things happening throughout Scripture, the sin, and it's, it, these people know that they're guilty because God has written these laws on their heart. But what God is doing here is he's saying, listen, these aren't just any old words that I'm saying. These are words that I'm saying as God, as Yahweh. And when I say something, it matters. It means something. It creates something. Now, the Israelites might have thought of that, that, but what happens if we see those words now? The first thing that popped in my mind, John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who's the Word? Jesus. And Jesus even speaks to this. It's, it's absolutely amazing. Look at in Matthew 5.17. It's on the screen. So Jesus said, don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. That's kind of a, a strange way of saying it, unless you understand what we've been talking about. Like, how in the world is Jesus fulfilling the law? Well, it's because he is that. He is the word of God himself. And because of that, he's able to come and perfectly do what it says. He's not saying that he's come to abolish it. As a matter of fact, that statement, what Jesus said, was right in the middle of his Sermon on the Mount where he was talking about the, the Ten Commandments. He was saying, listen, you've heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you lust in your heart, 
towards a woman, you've committed adultery in your heart. If you call somebody fool out of anger, you've murdered them in your heart. And what he was doing, he was getting to the heart of the matter behind the, the Old Testament laws and saying, listen, so I didn't come to abolish them. God forbid, I didn't do that. I came to fulfill them to the utmost because it's who I am, because I am God. At one point, Jesus was asked, which one's the greatest commandment then? He's trying to be tricked, right? What did he say? The most important, listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other command greater than these. So what did he say? The very first command, the greatest command, is he basically summed up the first four Ten Commandments and said, this is, this is the, the one, the most important thing. And then loving neighbor, that's, that's commandment five through ten. That's the second thing. Those are the most important things. And so listen, if you want to know how to live your life, live it in such a way that brings honor and glory to God, then you simply emulate Jesus. You look to Jesus. He's the fulfillment of that. He's done it. He understands it. He is the word of God himself incarnate in the flesh and living it out right there in front of us in scripture. And so we can follow him. Now this morning, you may have come in here and you go, man, this is, this is crazy. I've never thought about it in, in this way before. But listen, what's epic about the Ten Commandments is not necessarily just that there are these commandments that extend the covenant of Israel and codify the law so that they can become a nation. But what's epic is that they point to Jesus even to this day. And they show us even in the Old Testament, 1,500 years before Jesus ever came, they're already pointing to the word of God, to Jesus himself. And now here's the issue. I look at those Ten Commandments and I go, there's no way I can do these. Like, I can't be perfect. I've told lies. I've stolen things. I've done all of these things. I've taken the Lord's name in vain. I've come in here and worshiped in an empty way. There's no one of us in here that have done those Ten Commandments perfectly. And because of that, we've all fallen short of God's glory. And we deserve the just penalty for breaking those laws. And the just penalty for that is death. But what's so cool about this is Jesus said, listen, I didn't come to abolish the law. They're still in place, but I did come to fulfill them. And what he meant by that was he fulfilled them in such a way that he not only lived them out, but he was also going to pay the penalty in our place. So we deserve death because we broke all those laws. Jesus didn't deserve death because he lived imperfectly. But because he loves us so much, he died in our place. And now the Bible simply says all we have to do is confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead and we'll be saved. It's amazing. Jesus did all that for us. And so maybe this morning, you need to surrender your life to Christ. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart on who Jesus is. And I promise you can be saved today. And know that even if you've broken every single one of these commandments, God's merciful and he died for you. So you didn't have to die. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for this morning. I, th I thank you so much for your word. God, you are so good to have given us these laws that point to you. And so, God, I just pray that if there's anyone here this morning that has never surrendered their life to you, I pray that they would do that this morning. God, I pray that your, your spirit would just move in this place and touch the hearts of those people that might be here thinking they're here on accident. I don't know why, but you've got them here. And God, I just pray that you move and work in their lives and their hearts right now. God, I pray that they don't leave this building before they get it settled 
in their hearts and minds. And so God, I just pray that as we look to the scripture, we continually see you and emulate you in our lives. God, we love you. It's in your name I pray.